Well, my name is Johan Lönnroth. And uh, here I am. I was a member of the Swedish parliament 91 to 2003 and vice chairperson of the Swedish left party 93 to 2003. And here I am talking with the Swedish former prime, prime minister Joran Persson and finance minister Grosbrink in the parliament. My wife says that I am a narcissist. I like to put myself, my pictures on myself. You must excuse that. Uh, and my dissertation in economics was about Marx as a mathematician. And you can find me on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and I will not try to hide my opinions. But I will try to present others' opinions in a way they can accept. And of course, if you think that I I'm unfair to some of your idols. You must tell me, of course. We, we cannot have lots of discussion during, but of course, if you want to say something that's wrong or something like that, it's perfectly OK. Uh, we can have a short discussion. But it's a problem that this lecture, I, I think, Normally, I would need one, at least 100 hours for this lecture. So it's very, very compressed. Uh, but uh, I will put all those pictures on the web so you can see them this afternoon. Uh, so you can study them if you want to do that. And also, this is actually the first time I'm, I have talked in English in different occasions, but only sort of in political environments and not long lectures of this sort. Uh, and Edmé Dominguez told me that um, I, I have too much text on my pictures, and she's very right in this. But my English is not good enough to so, do like Jan or Scholte did, I mean, talk more freely. I will try to talk freely, but it's too much text, and you must excuse that. Well, first, I talk about capitalism. And what is capitalism? Uh, there are several definitions. I found this on dictionary.com, an economic system in which investment in and ownership of the means of production and exchange of wealth is made and maintained chiefly by private individuals or corporations, especially as contrasted to cooperatively or state-owned means of wealth. And this man, you know who it is, you have seen him probably sometime, uh, Marx, Karl Marx, and here is my interpretation of his definition. The capitalist mode of production is characterized by private ownership of the means of production, extraction of surplus value by the owning class for the purpose of capital accumulation and wage-based labor. Is it a big difference between this sort of mainstream definition and Marx definition? No, I think it's not, but the only real difference is that in Marx's version, which I will use in this lecture, self-employed private entrepreneurs without hired labor are not capitalists in my and Marx's definition. So when a person, uh, that have happened to me many times, person can, I am a capitalist now because I am rich, I won one million crowns. No, you are not a capitalist in this definition. To be a capitalist, you must have hired labor and, yeah. And of course, that's my definition. If you want to use another definition, it's up to you. Now I have a quotation from Marx. If money comes into the world with a congenital blood stain on one cheek, capital comes dripping from head to foot, from every pore with blood and dirt. 
And for Marx, this is very important, for Marx, money and capital are not the same things. Money and markets are very, very old phenomena, perhaps 3,000 years or so, so. But capital, in the Marxist sense, emerged much, much later, just a couple of hundred years ago. So what did Marx mean with blood and dirt? Well, he, my interpretation is that a big part of the capital used in capitalist production in Europe from the 18th century and onwards originally was accumulated by means of oppression, enslavement, and in some cases, genocide against indigenous populations in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Here is a slave auction to illustrate that. And here is, I think that's from Cortes, the Spanish army invading Mexico in the 16th century. Before industrial capitalism. Uh, John Ott talked about new, ca new mercantilism, so you probably know. Well, uh, I should have said that I know that you have very different backgrounds, and uh, uh, so it's a difficult task to, to know what you know. And so some, for some of you, this is very so, sort of elementary, and for some, it's perhaps not. Well, anyway, uh, mercantilism, the thinking of the merchants, dominated political economics in the 16th and 17th centuries. Its basic idea was that foreign trade was a zero-sum game and that a nation should maximize exports and minimize imports. So the mercantilists recommended a policy to promote export and import substitution, production to to avoid import of foreign goods. Economic policy was an integral part of warfare with the aim to damage the enemy's economy. And to illustrate that, I have an old ship and a cannon. OK, I think it's funny to have some pictures. In the 17th century, the Dutch and the English grew as economic powers, while the Ottomans and the Chinese were on the decline. Improvements in navigation and shipbuilding, together with silver and gold taken from the new continent in the West as global currencies, had made possible the establishment of the first global trading network. Wool became an important British export product and landowners expelled the peasants from their ancestral land to make room for sheep and let build great fences to stop them from returning. Here are some sheep. The former peasants had to sell their labor power to survive. They were employed in factories based on clever uh, technological advances as the steam engine and the mechanical loom. And here is a mechanical loom of the old type. Who is that? Anybody knows? Yeah, Adam Smith. He attacked mercantilism and said that two countries could both profit from trade. If I take an example. If wine in the south can be produced more cheaply than in the north, and if the northerners can produce iron more cheaply than the southerners, both can consume more of both goods if they specialize and trade. This is a so-called theory of absolute advantage. And Smith's most famous quotation. No, that comes later, soon. Uh, invisible hand, a very famous concept. And I have shortened and compressed the quotation a little. When a carpenter or butcher tries to produce goods of the greatest value for him, he intends only his own gain. And he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand 
to promote an end which was no part of his intention. But Smith was no ultra-liberal of the sort that lived 100 or 200 years later. He said that if two businessmen meet in a street corner, they begin to conspire against the market. So you must distinguish capitalism and markets. I like markets, but I don't like capitalism. Sometimes I call myself a market socialist. Even. Okay. This is, oh, I should have asked. Who is this? Oh, I already. David Ricardo. He extended Smith's theory of trade to a theory of comparative advantage. And I've made an example. If it takes one hour to produce a liter of wine and two hours to produce a kilo of iron in the south, they can produce 12 liters of wine in 12 hours. If it takes two hours to produce a liter of wine and three hours to produce a kilo of iron in the north, they can produce 12 kilo of iron in 36 hours. Bo is a professor in mathematics. He will check my calculations. It's very advanced calculations. Okay. If then seven liters of wine is exchanged for four kilo of iron, both can consume more of both goods. Five liters plus four kilo in south and seven liters and eight kilos in north with less working hours compared to if they had produced the consumed goods domestically with five plus eight equals 13 and in, in the south and 14 plus 24 equals 38 hours respectively in the north. Okay, in this theory, Transport costs and transaction costs and so on is disregarded. So that's, a, that's a, a problem with this theory, but you can understand the idea, comparative advantage. Here is some wine and some iron ore to illustrate it. Ricardo also developed a labor theory of value. The labor value of a good is determined by the total amount of labor required to produce it in the total production process. In the example above, we can assume that the labor value for wine or iron includes every moment of the process. Under perfect competition, the labor values also reflects the exchange values of the goods. In the example, two liters of wine is exchanged for one kilo of iron in the south and three liters of wine is exchanged for two kilo iron in the north, assuming only domestic trade. Well, there are lots of other simplifying assumptions be behind this theory, but uh, for instance, there is no land, no capital and so on. It's only labor forming the price, but um, this is the famous Ricardo's labor theory of value. For the argument is, for if wine was cheaper, uh, the wine producers would go over to iron and vice versa. That's also very much a simplification because if you are specialized in wine production, it's very difficult perhaps to learn to produce iron. But we, we economists, we disregard all problems. We make it easy for us. And, of course, this theory gave strong arguments for free trade and low tariffs. And now I would like to ask you, which neoliberal fundamentalist said this? Capitalism has, through its exploitation of the world market, given a cosmopolitan character to production and consumption in every country. To the great chagrin of reactionaries, it has drawn from under the feet of industry the national ground on which it stood. National one-sidedness and narrow-mindedness become more and more impossible. The cheap prices of commodities are the heavy artillery with which it batters down all Chinese walls. 
with which it, for, it forces the barbarians' intensely obstinate hatred of foreigners to capitulate. It compels all nations on pain of extinction to adopt the capitalist mode of production. Was this Milton Friedman? Or? Yeah. Who said that? Karl Marx and Friedrich Engel in the, Engels, in the Communist Manifesto. I have made this experiment in different leftists, uh, talk to leftists and, and ask them, could this be Marx? That's a, capitalism is good, <laughs> you could say. You could read the Communist Manifesto as a sort of, yeah. Capitalism is fantastic, develops the system until a certain point. And they, some of the leftist persons get very angry on me. They, I have been called because I heard that some person said that this course in global studies is too much left wing. Probably the professors in economics would say this is a left wing sort of. Ah. Uh, but I can comfort you who think this is bad that I have been called a neoliberal and I have been called a hysteric anti-Keynesian by some other leftists. So uh, you can't just say, put me in that corner, so to say. Okay, that's a parenthesis. Well, one of the most common misunderstandings of Marx is that he should have been critical against the liberal ideas about the invisible hand or free trade. His writings first and foremost dealt with production, not with circulation in the market. His critique against his contemporary political economists was that they made exploitation and class struggle invisible when they described capitalism as a harmonic system. He says that the market is a sort of veil and behind this veil capitalist exploitation is, is hidden. So you must distinguish between the market and capitalist production. Uh, yeah, so his critique was that, yes, that. His labor theory of value actually was a development of Ricardo's labor theory of value. Marx divides the labor value W into three parts, uh, constant capital, variable capital, and surplus value, and C is the labor value of materials used in the period plus the depreciated portion of tools and plants used in the process. And V is the quantity, the variable capital, is the quantity of labor time necessary to reproduce labor power, food, housing, etc., to make it possible for the worker to come back the next day and work again. And S is the time the worker war works for the capitalist. Surplus value. So Morse claimed that the capitalist can force the workers to work more than what is necessary to reproduce his or her own labor power. That's the basic Marxist idea with the labor theory of value. Then, in my view, in unfortunately, Marx did not only develop this in Capital Part One. He, he didn't publish it himself, but Engels and Marx's daughter published part two and three of Capital. And there he tries to show that the labor theory of value can be used to analyze the market. And that was a failure, in my view. That's my dissertation is about this. Uh, the so-called law of value, or the famous transformation problem discussed by Marxists in many, many Years. It's just a non problem. The labor theory is value. You can analyze capitalist exploitation, yes, but you can't analyze the capitalist market or any other market by means of the labor theory value. But I will not force you to go into this. Problem anymore. But 
the time will come when capitalism cannot develop the productive forces anymore. In Capital, Part 1, published in 1867, Marx wrote, uh, hand in hand with the expropriation of many capitalists by few on an ever-extending scale, the cooperative form of the labor process, the conscious technical application of science, the methodical cultivation of the soil, the transformation of the instruments of labor into instruments of labor only usable in common, the economizing of all means of production by their use as means of production of combined socialized labor, the entanglement of all peoples in the net of the world market leads to the international character of the capitalist regime. Centralization of the means of production and socialization of labor at last reach a point where they become incompatible with their capitalist integument. Do you know the concept integument? I didn't know myself, so I had to go to the dictionary. Hölje in Swedish. Yeah. Uh, thus, the integument is burst asunder. The knell of capitalist private property sounds. The expropriators are expropriated in some sort of revolution. Yes, but he never lived long enough. And if he stepped out from his grave today, he would see that the socialist revolutions so far have been big failures. I will come back to that. The period between 1871 and 1914 was a relatively stable period for a thriving capitalist development. And I talk mostly now on, about Europe and the United States, the Western world to simplify. Industrial companies based on electrical machines grew up like mushrooms after rain. Here is an electrical thing from the old times. Trains and ships driven by coal and oil transported goods over long distances. Construction of power stations and telephone network required financing. Big companies needed big banks. The banks had to cooperate, merge, take each other over. The world of finance began to grow even faster than the corporation. This is an old sort of bank office. Foreign exchange based on the gold standard fostered international trade and investment. There is gold. In here in the Nordic countries we had a common currency, you could say. Swedish and Norwegian and Danish crowns were the same in gold. And the same all over the Western world. Also in this period, Colonialism had its sort of high, yeah, what to say, uh, it reached its, high, its highest level. They had a conference in Berlin uh, and Africa was divided between the leading European powers. I won't go through, but just showing you the map, how they divided it. And in Asia, the colonial powers could exploit raw materials and cheap labor for more primitive forms of capitalism. And here is an Asian map from the old times. You can see you know, then how they have, to, not so much as in Africa, but to a certain degree, the French and the British and so on also divided Asia. And the big powers like China were so weak that they could be colonized, or at least not colonized. That, that's too much to say, but they were dominated by the Western powers. And who is this man? Then you must be a, probably a social democratic activist to know who this man is, but nobody knows. He was a very important person. His name was Edward Bernstein. And Marx died in 81. A more moderate and reformist pattern of ideas took over in the more advanced countries. 
Engels died in 1895, and Bernstein became the leading instigator of the so-called revisionist version of Marxism. He denied the inevitability of class conflict and of a sudden collapse of capitalism. Here is his book, Evolutionary Socialism. Bernstein argued, argued for a more practical, peaceful movement towards a socialist state within a parliamentary democracy. He was also rather positive towards colonialism, which he thought that the labor movement should accept as the right of the higher culture. And the international labor movement. You had social democracy in most, at least, uh, continental Europe and northern Europe, and also, uh, yeah, uh, in the south, but more of an anarchistic type in the south, most of them. But they formed, anyway, the second international. And here is their, the delegates in the 1907 Stuttgart Congress. And uh, now did you uh, see if I can find any of the famous? Oh, no, now it takes, I think that that might be was a Luxembourg there. Now, anyway, uh, in a resolution, war was declared to be the result of competition of capitalist nations in the world market, bolstered by national prejudices cultivated in the interest of the ruling classes. The working class should do all they can to prevent the breaking out of the war. Should war nevertheless follow, the socialists should intervene to bring it to a speedy end and to make use of the economic and political crisis created by the war to hasten the breakdown of the predominance of the capitalist class. And here is one of the delegates. And who is that? Hmm? Leonino. One of the delegates was the Bolshevik Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. He was a firm opponent to revisionism. He wanted that the working class should arm themselves and use the war to smash the capitalist system. He said, the war is a result of a parasitic and decaying capitalism in which the bourgeoisie more and more live on monopoly profits capital exports, and by clipping coupons, rentiers, so to say. The high profits from colonial exploitations make it possible for the capitalists to bribe sections of the workers with higher wages. It follows a bond between imperialism and the opportunist leaders of the workers' movement who choose to support chauvinism and nationalism in their respective countries. This, was, this has led to a split in the labor movement. But the revisionists are wrong, said Lenin. The period of imperialism is the eve of the socialist revolution. And here is my favorite, all categories. Uh, she was also there in Stuttgart, Rosa Luxemburg. Or I should have asked you, did anyone recognize her? When Lenin, after the split in the Russian party in 1903, wanted to silence his critics, she attacked Lenin's Jacobinian demand for obedience of majority decisions. Against Lenin's idea about the party as a disciplined army, she praised the spontaneous actions of the masses. She also rejected war as a solution to political problems, since war would just lead to disaster for both the classes. In the accumulation of capital from 1912, it's written in German, but it's, a, it's a, an English translation, unless not translated into Swedish, as far as I know. She had also dared to criticize Marx, who too much saw modern capitalism, that part of the world where socialism first was to emerge, England, the US, Germany, and France, as a closed system. 
That is why he could not see, says Rosa, that as long as the most advanced capitalist systems can export surplus capital to and hire labor from non-capitalist or semi-capitalist states, they can survive. Therefore, socialism cannot come into until capitalism has conquered the world. Socialism in one country was an impossible idea for Rosa. And in a book, famous book written in the prison in uh, 1918, she wrote the tacit, because that is after the Russian Revolution, the tacit assumption underlying the Lenin Trotsky theory of dictatorship is that the socialist transformations is something for which a ready made formula lies completed in the pocket of the revolutionary party. But the socialist system should only be and can only be an historical product born out of the school of its own experiences. It's a fantastic book. She also describes if you try to, to diminish democracy and, be, and build walls around you, you will see to it, you, you will have stagnation and disaster. And today, uh, in the textbooks in the Eastern countries, it said that Rosa Luxemburg was a big revolutionary, but she was wrong on the national issue, they said. But it was, she was right and they were wrong. The socialism in one country is impossible. In my view, you are, of course are free to think something else. After the revolution 1917, Russia was invaded from the West. During the Civil War, central military planning led by Leo Trotsky with forced deliveries of food from the peasants played a dominant role in the economy. Here is Trotsky. He still has followers all over the world. After the communist victory, the economy was in chaos. In 1921, Lenin had to announce the new economic policy allowing private ownership and market prices in agricultural production. Nikolai Burkarin, here is Nikolai Burkarin. He referred to Marx and said that the productive forces were not ripe for socialism in agriculture in Russia. But Stalin, who took power in the end or in the middle of the 20s, uh, he decided that it was necessary to collectivize the farms by force in order to secure deliveries of cheap food to support a growing industrial working class. The result was mass starvation, terror and inefficiency in agriculture, but also an impressive growth of heavy industry in the 1930s. Here is Stalin. And now I go back to capitalism. I want to say this about the events in Soviet Russia and the Eastern world because uh, the theme of this lecture is the, how they conquered the world. So we shall soon see that those systems didn't survive and try to discuss why they didn't survive. But now we go back to capitalism. And you can ask, why have Germans always feared inflation? It's a very interesting example of that history always lives for a long time. This is a picture in the end of the First World War, a destroyed country. Mass unemployment in Germany after the war. The peace treaty of Versailles demanded Germany to pay an amount around 18 billion euro, euro measured in today's purchasing power for the damage done during the war. The government saw no other solutions than to print money. The result was hyperinflation. In November 1923, the dollar cost 4,200 billion mark. If some of you collect stamps, you can see fine stamps from this time with absurd values, uh, number of billion marks. Here is, a, is a, the currency, 500 million mark. You can perhaps buy a leaf of bread from that. And this man, who is that? I don't have to ask. Uh, 
Hitler. A growing number of Germans listened to this man who attacked the Versailles Treaty as a treason, a knife in the back, and blamed the hyperinflation on Jewish bankers. And who is this? Yeah, that's John Maynard Keynes, a very interesting figure. One of the junior members of the British delegation in Versailles was John Maynard Keynes. He argued against the big German re reparations with the argument that they would not only destroy Germany economically and politically, but also be negative for export in the victorious nations like France and Britain since Germans before the war had been one of the biggest importers. Instead, he wanted the US government uh, to launch a vast credit program to restore Europe to prosperity as soon as possible. But especially the French, where the Germans should be punished, so they didn't listen. And nobody in the beginning listened. But after the employ unemployment crisis in the beginning of the 20s and the German hyperinflation, many European politicians understood that Keynes basically was right. The German debt was cut down and the gold standard was restored. And the general upswing followed. And here is a man you probably do not recognize. Perhaps one of the Swedes. No, probably not. His name was Gustav Kassel. In the second half of the 1920s, capitalism thrived and almost every economist outside Soviet Russia believed in the ability of unregulated competitive markets to accomplish prosperity, stability and full employment. The Swede Gustav Kassel was hailed as the world's leading economist when he spoke for the US Congress in 1928. He published a textbook where he wrote that if wages just follows the law of supply and demand of competitive markets, unemployment will disappear. It's very easy. Just use the market mechanism and unemployment will disappear. And that was a very general opinion among, among economists. Uh, my colleagues think that I am very critical to the... They don't like when I draw up these old stories, but I like it to draw them up. Well, and who is this? He's perhaps a little more famous than Gustav Kassel. His name was Ivar Kryger. He was another Swede, who by aggressive investments and innovative financial instruments built a global match and financial empire. In negotiated match monopolies, with European and Central and South American governments and finally controlled between two-thirds and three-quarters of worldwide match production, becoming known as the match king. His participating debentures, here is a participating debenture, you can't read it, but it's a sort of mixture between stocks and bonds. And they attracted both small savers and big investors all over the world. Before this period, you could say that only bigger capitalists owned, but now small savers, small businessmen uh, began to buy because the neighbor said, oh, see, my Krieger paper did have gone up 100% in three weeks. And then his friend ran to the, to the bank and bought shares and so on. It was a sort of fantastic bubble growing up. But on Thursday, the 21st of October 1929, the New York Stock Exchange panicked. The share prices fell like stones. People rushed to the banks to take out their money, and many banks, companies, and individuals went bankrupt. You are you can remember, most of you, uh, what happened in 2008, perhaps. You were very young then, but anyway, uh, it was a similar situation. Uh, the supply of money in the US fell more than 30%. 
U.S. imports also fell, and so the crisis spread over the world with mass unemployment. Governments who were taught by the economists to balance the, their budgets cut down expenditures to match falling tax incomes. This led to an ever even bigger unemployment in, in a vicious circle. It was a sort of downturn for everything. Here you have some pictures from the journals. It's, um, I'm an unemployment queue there. Uh, yeah, that's the market up there, uh, Wall Street market. Yeah. And Hitler and his Nazis came to power in Germany in January '33 and initiated a program for mass investment in military equipment, freeways, and cars. And Volkswagen, he in his Mein Kampf, he, he sketched these ideas with a Volkswagen, in accordance with what, yeah, what they wrote in Mein Kampf. And who is this? Franklin D. Roosevelt, yes. In '32, he was, became US president and launched a federal investment program called the New Deal. And of course, it, you can't compare Roosevelt to Hitler, but if you only take a, sh a sort of narrow-minded economic perspective. It was a similar sort of effect. Massive investments, federal or state programs. And social democratic parties abandoned the dream of a socialist transformation and adopted policies in order to make capitalism more stable and egalitarian. The Swedish Prime Minister Per Albin Hansson talked about a people's home at Folkhem. Actually, it was a concept taken from German conservatives in older times, but we could make a home which is good, which is good both for capitalists and workers. Uh, and this was, after a while, very popular. 1936, Keynes published the magnum opus, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. There he claimed that capitalism is a is an unstable system. If the capitalists and their managers foretell good times, then good times will come and their optimistic forecasts will be confirmed. But if they prophesy bad times, then bad times will ensue, thus validating the original pessimism. Prophecy therefore becomes self-fulfilling. He wrote, we devote our intelligences to anticipating what an average opinion expects average opinion to be. But Keynes, Keynes also claimed that there is a remedy. The state can stabilize capitalism and accomplish full employment if it spends enough money to see to it that the total purchasing power is equal to the capacity to produce. This meant that the state shall borrow money when the capitalists do not invest enough in the depression times and pay back when the business cycle is going up again. Contracyclical finance policies, it's called in economists' jargon. And he also wrote, if nations can learn to provide themselves with full employment by their domestic policy, there need be no important economic forces to set the interest of one country against that of neighbors. And he also predicted a more active state to control investment and he also spoke of the euthanasia, a murder, a self-murder sort of uh, the rentier as a result of a low interest rates policy. And now the last picture before we take a break. Who is this man? Keynes' opponent. No, you're there. No. Austria. Hmm? Yeah, you, are, you have studied this. Uh, Friedrich von Hayek. Most economists were still in the 1930s critical to Keynes' ideas. The most important of them was the Austrian Friedrich von Hayek, who said that politicians can only stimulate employment in the short run 
after a time, inflation goes up and markets are biased and employment falls back again. And if you go to YouTube, you can see two very funny when Keynes and Hayek raps in two rounds. Uh, here they are. Uh, but for especially my uh, women should be warned. For the extreme male chauvinists, lots of ladies running around with drinks to them, short uh, skirts and so on. Yeah, uh, but it's uh, very funny, uh, and it's also instructive. But I have, I don't have time to show it. You can go into, into. You can write in Keynes and Hayek and rapping on YouTube. You can see it. Okay, shall we take a quarter of an hour's break? Okay?